we're into day number four of the World Cup. As you can see, we've had eight games so far, and I think most people will agree with me when I say I think it's been a thoroughly entertaining World Cup so far. Um, we don't seem to have had any sort of crowd trouble or anything like that. So the focus has been on the football, the VAR, the video assistant referee, um, seems to be working very well. Many people were worried about that. And all in all, we've had some uh, interesting results come through and some excellent games of football. Very, very intriguing. If not perhaps technically the best like football on offer, but certainly tactically intriguing and like very very interesting to watch so far so let's go through the matches so far like chronologically I guess so we start off on June the 14th with uh, Russia versus Saudi Arabia well um, I didn't see this one coming <laughs> um, all the reports from the Russian camp was that uh, the Russian team were not looking good that they were very old that they've done poorly in qualif well not qualifying but their friendlies that they had um, certainly I think they only had they, didn't, they only had like one shot on target in their previous two friendly games or something like that and um, it's yeah very interesting now from kind of watching this match of these of the two lowest ranked teams in the tournament that's important to remember the gap between Russia and Saudi Arabia was clearly pretty massive, but the biggest problem, I think, was the way Saudi Arabia played. They tried to play very attacking, they tried to go for it, and um, ultimately, um, you know, they didn't. They, you know, they just played into Russia's hands, basically. Um, I mean, <laughs> by the end, it was a rout. Saudi Arabia's defence were just all over the place. They, they really were not very good. But um, fair play to them for actually trying to play football. You know, I've, I've kind of often said people talk about, oh, you know, should we expand the World Cup if we're going to get have games like this? And the truth of the matter is, the only way Saudi Arabia will get better is if they play games like this in the World Cup, because in their qualifying, they're playing against teams which are at their own level below them. And, uh, you know, it's difficult for their team to progress if they're not, you know, playing against those top teams and learning from those experiences. I think it was a little naive for them to come in to this game with such a kind of attacking mindset and they got punished badly. Uh, I would say that Denis Shurashev, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm going to butcher some names by the way, so bear with me on that. But I will say that I think he did excellently. Um, both his goals were taken really well, especially the, uh, I think it was the second one with the outside of his foot. That was uh, that was a nice goal. Um, and yeah, bizarrely, you know, he wasn't starting in the game and he looked by far Russia's best player. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it was really, really interesting to see this game and just the, the gap between them. I mean, at the end of the day, most of Saudi Arabia's players play, you know, around the Saudi Arabia area. Uh, I believe that some of their, they kind of like, it was it was considered a partnership, but I believe Saudi Arabia paid for uh, like a, half a dozen of their players to be inserted into the Spanish league. I think it was Celta Vigo um, and trained with them. Only a couple of them actually got any game time and it was very limited. So maybe it backfired a little bit, but they wanted to, you know, improve their players and, and see what it's like. I mean, most of the Russians play in the Russian league, but the Russian league is still at a pretty good level, you know, far better than Saudi Arabia. So, you know, I think technically the Russians, like on paper, Russia are better than their ranking suggests. And certainly if they perform like this, they'll be better. But let's face it, they will have tougher tests coming up. Um, it's great though to see a host nation um, like come through and um, uh, you know play so well. It, it really is good in the open.
opening match because I think it gives the whole tournament a lift. Like if Russia come out and got, you know, spanked by Saudi Arabia, then um, you know, I think it, you know people, the locals might have not been that interested. But it gives them a bit of a joy. And sure, you know, they still might not qualify from the group. I, I would still bet on um, you know Egypt and Uruguay to uh, get through. But it does add a lot of spice to it, and goal difference could count a lot. So gonna be interesting but also that Saudi Arabia defense coming up against you know Egypt with a fit Mo Salah and Uruguay with a uh, Luis Suarez and Edson Cavani Ooh. they better uh, adjust their way of thinking pretty quick because that's not gonna work out well for them so speaking of Egypt and Uruguay um, had uh, one nil nil to uh, Uruguay um, which was uh, scored very late on uh, 89th minute by Jimenez header from um, a set piece um, I wasn't impressed with either of these sides honestly um, I thought Egypt looked very flat without Mo Salah he was a substitute but he didn't come on at all uh, Uruguay on paper again very very solid team but they really just didn't look at the races at all. Um, I don't know, maybe they thought. I, I don't know, really. Uh, I know that. Well, like Suarez just didn't really look like Suarez. Like, one of the things which defines Suarez, I think, is that he has this readiness to um, just. He's like just really aggressive all the time and he puts himself about a lot. He's kind of similar in a way, like a more skillful kind of Diego Costa in a way. Um, you know, he's just that kind of guy and he didn't really look like that in this game. And certainly he had some chances which you would have expected him to finish off, but he didn't. So he looked a bit rusty, but Uruguay still came out with a win. Um, and that puts them, you know, in pole position because they've got to play Russia and Saudi Arabia. And really, they'll get a win against Saudi Arabia, let's face it, which will put them through. So I think Uruguay are, are going to be good. Uh, to go well how they do against Russia I mean we have to see as I said I think Russia were flattered by Saudi Arabia's defence a little bit but they certainly would have got a lot of confidence out of that so you know sometimes that can make the difference and Egypt well again um, they look quite flat they, they probably deserved a draw out of this to be fair um, but uh, you know they do look a little bit devoid of like top top talent without Mo Salah don't they so he'll be back against Russia and Saudi Arabia um, and I think I mean they're capable of beating both those teams but you know the pressure is now on them because they have to beat both those teams you know if uh, let me think if Russia can uh, get a draw against uh, Uruguay a draw against like Egypt then they're through and Egypt aren't um, uh, so, yeah, it, it's all to play for. It's, it's an interesting group. Uh, I think that uh, Egypt goalkeeper made a couple of really good saves as well. Uh, so, kind of credit to him. I think this tournament has been, we've seen some excellent goalkeeping going on. So, you know, absolutely uh, great to see. Perhaps some not quite so good goalkeeping going on uh, as well. Uh, next up, we had Iran versus Morocco, which. Uh, again, I'll watch this. It wasn't the most entertaining match, but it was quite fascinating to see these two teams. Morocco has a fair amount of flair in their side, but Iran were just really, really well drilled. Um, they have Carlos Quieres as their manager, who people might remember as Sir Alex Ferguson's assistant manager, um, and who's had plenty of jobs but never really kind of um, done that well in, in his kind of jobs but he um, you know he did a great job for Iran there I don't that's not their first win I think they won in the 94 World Cup um, but certainly a long time coming you know and yeah it was an own goal and it was a terrible own goal firstly conceding the free kick uh, over on the right hand side or left hand side for Iran uh, you know moments before the end of the match is shocking uh, very very poor kind of game management and um, you know the, the, the just it, I don't know it's one of those 
ones where I feel like that free kick could be taken a hundred times and that header wouldn't go in. It was just perfect, you know. Uh, I feel so sorry. There's been quite a lot of own goals so far. I've been a lot of penalties, a lot of own goals, um, which I think is kind of showing a, a nervousness in defence, shall we say. Uh, especially amongst the, like, well, even actually with the top teams as well, to be fair. Um, but yeah, not much they could do. I kind of, in a weird way, I'm kind of rooting for Iran because they've had it tough, you know, because of um, the kind of political status of Iran. Like, Nike couldn't provide them with boots, I think it was. And they, there's a host of other things that they, like, embargoed on them. And whatever you think of, like, politics and, and you know, Iran as a, as a country and anything else, at the end of the day, this is just a group of, like, you know, players coming to a World Cup, you know, trying to do their best. And, like, it is a shame sometimes when politics gets in the way of that because the World Cup's to be celebrated, countries coming together, not, oh, you know, we're going to impose international embargoes on you. <laughs> but, you know, that's a bit too political for me, shall we say. Uh, God, look at this. I'm going all over places on my website. So, yeah, another interesting game, for sure. Then we had what has been by far the game of the tournament, if not one of the games of the World Cup, like, in recent history. A 3-3 between Portugal and Spain. I mean, whew, this was a hell of a game. I was watching this game in uh, 4K HDR, and it was just such a treat. Um, the BBC uh, in the UK are showing games in 4K HDR on their BBC iPlayer. Um, so, you know, if you use a VPN, you could probably get that if you wanted to. They just go through the app. Um, ITV, on the other hand, who are the other broadcasters, so they're sharing matches. So one's doing one, one's doing the other. ITV are like on their. I had can't manage to even find a, a HD stream, like a 720 or 1080p stream on their website. So I'll have to probably look at elsewhere, shall we say? Because I've been watching their games in like 480p, which is painful coming from like 4K HDR. But um, yeah, this was a, a, a real treat, obviously. Um, with what's happened with Spain and their coach, which I think is an absolute diabolical decision, personally. Um, it's shocking, you know. If you don't know what happened, basically the um, Spain manager was announced as the Real Madrid manager, like, nearly, like, three or four days before the World Cup. Uh, it turns out that they had only just told the Spanish FA president, like, literally five, ten minutes before the announcement, the Spanish FA president was incensed at that. Now, I can understand him being angry at that, absolutely. So he decides to sack the Spain manager with like three days to go after he had an unbeaten record with them. I mean, he won six, drew four. Um, I just think it, it, it's insane. If you're the FA president, I think you have to put your personal feelings aside from what is good for the country because we'll never know how Lopetegui would have done at this World Cup. We're only going to be able to judge what is there. And if Spain do well, even win it, then everyone's going to be saying, well, it was because of the way Lopetegui set it up. And if Spain do badly, then the FA president's going to get the blame. He said when he made a decision, either way, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get blame for this. I don't think anyone would have blamed him if he hadn't have sat the manager three days before the tournament. I think he easily could have come out and said, I'm very disappointed that we got treated this way. You know, but uh, basically it's too late to change now. I, I think I can understand him being annoyed at that. Uh, I mean, we don't know what happened behind the scenes. So, you know, we can only go on what we see. But I personally think it would be a bad decision. I think if Gareth Southgate had announced three days beforehand that he was joining, like, Chelsea or Man United or someone like that, I don't think the English FA would have sacked him personally. So I maybe think there that the Spanish FA would maybe got a bit emotional. Um, I do understand that the Spanish FA don't want to basically let Real Madrid and Barcelona get away with everything and, you know, 
could probably feel that they are sometimes overshadowed by those two clubs. But again, I think this is a situation where for the common good, he had to swallow his pride a little bit there and kind of get on with it. I don't think people would have... Um, I mean, the, the argument there, I, I don't even think it was. I mean, if, Spain, if Lobedegui had stayed as manager, Spain had done badly at the World Cup. Like, I think people would have blamed Lopetegui and been like, well, he had his eye on there. I don't think people would have said, well, the FA president should have sacked him beforehand. So I think he wasn't in a, a lose-lose situation, but I think he chose the worst option of the two. Um, so coming into this match, obviously, there's a lot of talk about Spain, how they were going to line up. Fernando Hierro, uh, the ex-Real Madrid and Bolton defender, uh, kind of took over. He was part of the coaching setup, and he basically said, look, we haven't had any time to do anything different, so we're going to go with what how we were set up beforehand. Um, yeah, it, you know, fascinating match. Obviously, Cristiano Ronaldo is the standout there. I've been a little bit critical of Ronaldo. Um, in a, in, and it's critical in a sense of um, his high level. Okay, without doubt, Messi and Ronaldo are on another level to every other player in the world. Um, you know, Messi just seems to conjure magic from everywhere. Ronaldo is a little bit more pragmatic, but like. You have to admire, without doubt, whatever you think of him, he is a competitor, he is full of confidence in everything he does, there's just not an ounce of self-doubt with him. Athletically, he is probably fitter than people half his age, well, that would be weird because they'd be like 17, wouldn't they, but you know what I mean, you know, he keeps himself in sh he is a model professional, and he has a lot of talent and skill and technique to go with that. Um, so, but I've been critical of him a little bit because I feel like um, he does have a tendency to, in his later years now, kind of stroll around the pitch a little bit and not get involved too much, especially with like Portugal, um, because he plays that kind of poacher role. It's a different role to what he's played earlier in his career. He was much more of a kind of winger cutting in, um, and then he moved to you know being a, a striker, I guess as. I don't know, I'd say it's time caught up, but athletically you can see he's still quality um, there, but like one thing which has always impressed me about him is how good his heading is, um, you know, that's usually a weak point for people who've come through from the wing, but his heading is probably the best in the world, if you know, he's up there with the best in the world anyway, you know, excluding obviously Peter Crouch. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, Four minutes into the match, Ronaldo gets taken down in the area. Absolute clear penalty. You know, very, very poor from that Joe. And Ronaldo, like, dispatched it. I mean, as I said, confidence plays so much into his role. And he absolutely loves being the centre of attention. There are a lot of players out there, I think, who struggle a little bit with that kind of role. But Ronaldo just loves it. And I don't know, sometimes people think of that as like an arrogance. Um, I don't think it's an arrogance I think it is literally like a self-confidence and football is about that so much how many times do we see strikers go through a rough spell and they're confident and you know we talk about their confidence being down and they miss easy chances Christian Benteke I'm looking at you but like with Ronaldo I just don't feel like there's ever been that doubt in him he just never seems to show it um, like he believes he's the best player in the world and um I'm not going to get into that argument either way. Um, he's absolutely in the top two. I don't even know how you would measure it, to be fair. But, um, you know, he's light years ahead of everyone else, barring Lionel Messi. And it's obviously a pleasure to, to watch him play. Now, you know, he obviously got the penalty, which he worked very well. Um, he was then a little bit lucky with his second goal, De Gea, with what we would count in England as an uncharacteristic error because he's so good for Man United but with Spain he has made a few errors so I don't know what that's about I was reading that maybe his head's getting turned a little bit because of Lopetegui going to Real Madrid and Real Madrid maybe making a bit there etc etc um, 
I don't know. I think he's better than that. I, I, I don't know what. I, I think we can put it down to a um, just a simple, uncharacteristic error. I don't know if there was any footage of Ramos uh, elbowing him in the head beforehand, but uh, I don't know. But yeah, just a, a, a bad one there. Um, and Ronaldo steps up at the end. We'll talk about that in a minute. Diego Costa, meanwhile, is putting on his own show. Uh, a couple of fantastic goals, giving Spain something they've missed. Um, certainly, I say missed. I mean, they still won European Championships and World Cups without a striker like Costa. But without a doubt, you can see that first goal was just superb. You know, he really outmuscled uh, the defence. Just doing that, that looked like vintage Costa, you know, at his time when he was at his peak at Chelsea. Um, or Atletico, to be fair. Um, and I feel like if he was perhaps a little bit more dedicated, shall we say, a little bit more, um, a little less emotional about some things, a little bit more Ronaldo-esque in his professionalism, then I think he would be uh, just such a good player. But maybe also that edge that he has, that's what maybe allows him to play in that way, you know. But, you know, without doubt, He's a, a, a top, top striker, you know, world-class striker. And, you know, he showed it in this game. A couple of excellent goals. The second one kind of poaching in there, which is exactly, you know, what he should be doing, you know. Nacho put Spain 3-2 up with uh, just a sublime finish. Just, I love that type of shot where it just skims. Like, you know, it's, it's maybe like a foot off the ground and just skims along, like stays at the same level. It hit, like... Um, what two posts and then went in and it's like oh that was that was probably one that might be the goal of the tournament um, might be we've seen some other very good ones as well not least by Ronaldo for his third goal um, what you, <laughs> the funny thing is everyone's like oh Ronaldo oh he's so good blah 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 okay, he did miss 45 free kicks before this one let's get some perspective there he's not a free kick expert okay but, without doubt, that was a special free kick. It was fantastic. You know, he used this kind of special technique, which I don't know if he developed, but he's kind of been known for, where he manages to get it kind of like up and over the wall. It, it gives it like a this magnificent dip on it, you know, to get it over the wall, but, but, you know, under, without having to like curl it round or anything like that. Um, we've seen Bale kind of learn from that, I think, and he's, he's done some. I'd, I'd argue Bale's better at free kicks than Ronaldo, but hey, that's that's for another day. But yeah, a hat-trick for Cristiano Ronaldo in his first game in the World Cup. Like, he can't argue with that. Let's not forget Portugal are the European champions. You know, it's, it's hard to look at their side and go, there's world-class players in there. I don't think there is. I think they were shown up a little bit sometimes by Spain as well. I don't know how much Lopetegui being sacked has affected Spain. Um, I don't know how much it, this was just the Cristiano Ronaldo show, really. Um, I think Spain did enough to win this game. So I think Portugal, like, were... I don't want to say lucky, but Portugal drew because Cristiano Ronaldo like turned up and had one of his days you know and you can't really argue with that but I think Spain like there were some good saves and there were some very close shots from Spain and obviously the hair error and just a dumb penalty and a dumb free kick <laughs> um, you know to concede and uh, you know they would probably have won this fairly comfortably but hey that's where you go isn't it you know that's that's football um, but without doubt, the, the game of the tournament so far, like if we have you know, more games like that, then I'm so up for this, uh, this World Cup. So that was day two. Um, it's a good football. We had four games on Saturday. Um, France, Australia. I didn't catch all of this game. Um, but France, on the whole, just didn't look very good. Australia, as I kind of thought, very gritty, very hard working, uh, perhaps not a lot of amazing talent there. So happy to see Jendiak score the penalty. Um, he's an ex Palace player, ex Palace captain, and like he is epitome of like hard working, like we'll just run all 
day like but actually has quite a lot of talent as well with it like he's, he's one of Australia's like probably best ever players um, a very very good player I think and they have some good players you know through through the ranks but it's kind of propped up by a lot of pretty average players so you would expect France with just this team of like just ridiculous players and if they've got the, the squad that she put out um, Oh, there we go, lineup. Sorry, FIFA. Look at that France lineup. Lloris in goal for Reign, Umtiti, Hernandez, Pavard, Tolisso, Kante, Pogba, and Pape, Griezmann, Debele. Uh, I mean, <sighs> this is the problem with France right now. And look at that bench as well. Who can they bring on? Fekir, uh, Matuidi, Giroud, Lamar, uh, Thalvan. It's just ridiculous. Um, you know, who have Australia got to bring on? Tim Kane is like 40 uh, no offence Tim Kayo is still a good player but you know what I'm saying uh, so yeah just ridiculous and France you know they were lucky as hell um, there have been question marks around the French penalty so Griezmann being taken down uh, I think um, that the decision was correct that it was a penalty our decision and people have been a bit like oh I don't know if this is on go I guarantee you if we didn't have VAR people would have been like oh that's a penalty you know we should have brought in VAR or you know I guarantee the French are going that was a definitely penalty the Australians are going oh it wasn't a penalty but you know it's just the way it goes isn't it um, yeah I mean as usual Kante was excellent and that's kind of all I have to say about the French side. They were just not good. But Titi giving away the penalty with what was just mind-numbingly bad play. <laughs> like, it just, there was no one even around him. And I don't know why, but he just decided to stick his arm out and punch the ball like it's an idiot, basically. Um, yeah, but like, the front three. You know, as, as sad as it is, because Dembele and Pape Griezmann on paper sounds like just a fantastic front three, but they just didn't look like they could work together that well. And they looked much better when Giroud came on. Good old Carl Giroud coming on, um, showing up those 50 million plus pound players, 100 million pound players. Um, Griezmann just recently announced in a kind of bizarre video that he is going to be staying at, at Atletico. There was rumours. Barcelona are going to pick him up. I'm really happy he's staying at Atletico. It's I know, but like nobody wants to see the monopoly of like Barcelona Real in Spain. Like I really want Atletico to start challenging more. Um, it's just good for everyone, you know. And for them to start doing uh, buy Munich and just buying all the best players in the league to not only weaken your opponents but strengthen you, you know, would be just the end of that, really. So. I think that's a really important signing for Atletico Madrid to actually get him in there. And hopefully they can, you know, challenge for that title next season. But, um, yeah, Pogba just not looking good the whole game. It's just such a, like, I, I don't know what it is with Paul Pogba. He's a player who is kind of like, I feel, the opposite of, like, Ronaldo in as much as his attitude. Like, Ronaldo just has all this confidence, and even if he has a bad spell, he still has the confidence to you know, step up and take penalties or step up and score important goals uh, because he just believes in himself so much. I kind of feel like Pogba doesn't, in a way. Um, when we saw him at his best, he was obviously with Pirlo. Um, and, uh, oh God, what's his name? Begins with M. Um, I think it begins with M. It's the other Juventus midfielder. I can't remember his name now. I apologise. It's gone. Um, and I feel like because he was kind of the junior of the, the, the three there, like that kind of worked to me. Like I don't feel like he's a leader out there on the pitch, which is what people expect him to be. Um, and I think he just shies away from the game a lot of the time. So I think there's a, a there's mental problems there with him. Uh, because clearly he's talented athletically, technically, he's he's got everything. But it just there's something mentally holding him back. Um, but we'll see um, and yeah 
yeah, just France as a whole, just not looking very good. They could get better as the tournament goes on. I, I kind of said before, I don't rate uh, Didier Deschamps as a manager, to be fair, to get the best out of France. So I don't think they're going to get past like the quarters. Um, but we'll see. Not a great game overall for that one. Argentina-Iceland was a great game in my opinion. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed seeing Argentina get very frustrated by um, Iceland. If we look at those two teams, there's obviously a wealth of difference. Um, it did actually disappoint me a little bit how defensive Argentina were. They played basically with two holding midfielders, which I found bizarre because the thing is, Iceland are a good side, okay? I understand paying them respect. Um, they're just a very well organised, hard working, um, technically actually really good as well side. Um, very dangerous on set plays, very dangerous counter attacking. I understand that. But you know you're going to get the majority of the possession. Let's have a look at how much they had. Um, Distinct, here we go. Possession. 72% of the possession. So you know you're going to get that. And you play with. You know, Mascherano and Biglia. I can't work that out. Like, in my opinion, I'd have Mascherano sitting, yes. And instead of Biglia, I'd pay like Diabala uh, up there with Kun and then have Messi just behind them. Because you know you're going to get the, the majority of the, the play there. And you want a play that's going to be able to pick out a pass. Um, you know, do that type of stuff. Uh, unlock the defence. And they just, they just look really poor, uh, Argentina. Aguero's goal was excellent, like what you would expect from Aguero, which is give him a chance, even half a chance, he'll put it away. Uh, Messi, he didn't have the worst game. People are making out like he was so bad. He wasn't. Yes, he missed a penalty. That's pretty bad. Um, his People have said that his penalty taking is really bad. It, it does seem to have got worse, but overall, his statistically, he scores 77% of his penalties, which is pretty much average for a footballer. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you could argue maybe Aguero would be a better choice for that, it'll be interesting to see if they get another penalty, but again, you know, like Ronaldo, Messi is that guy who wants to be there, doing everything, you know, he's the captain, he wants to be there scoring, and we know that Argentina's defence is suspect, um, Caballero was not great in goal, um, but yeah, I feel like they need they need to go to a strength, and I feel like if they can win a game three two, then it's better than what they kind of showed out there. And they're in a bit of a pickle in this group now, you know, they really are. It, it will be interesting. Iceland, however, uh, I didn't I don't like the comments from people who are like, oh, Iceland refused to play football. Listen, okay, Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina has 45 times the population of the entire country of Iceland, the smallest nation to ever compete in the World Cup. I know people are bored of hearing of that, but it's true. And the fact that they uh, have so many very excellent players and they work so hard as a team, you can see that. Their manager is a dentist. <laughs> Their goalkeeper is a part-time film director. Uh, I think their right back is like a salt seller or something like that. Like, it's ridiculous, okay? They're not exactly... Yeah, you know, they've got some good players like Sigurdsson, Gunnarsson, I think, uh, Boxen, um, you know, they've got some good players. But, you know, the point is that if they're, they're going to... If they go out and play... They try and play football against Argentina, like Saudi Arabia, they're going to get smashed. They've got to play to their strengths, and their strength is sit deep, counter-attack. Exactly what they did. They did very well. Um, they could easily have won this game. Their goalkeeper did very, very well, though. We'll say that. Um, he needs to quit being a film director and uh, focus on football because he's really good. I, I've seen like much worse goalkeepers in the Premier League than him. I think Crystal Palace got a worse goalkeeper in the Premier League than him. Uh, and you can tell that this team is a team which is very, um, you know, there's the opposite to like France almost where there's so much teamwork and team ethic you know they work hard for each other you can see that and uh, you know 
Highlights of France are just a collection of individuals. Uh, and, you know, when Argentina can bring on, like, Benega, Higuain, and, and not bring on, like, Diabala, um, it's it's fascinating they did manage to win this game. And, and they just did not look convincing, you know. I can understand wanting to have a balanced approach. I really can, but... I'm sure in Argentina right now, those players and that team are getting slaughtered right now. Um, but I will say that Iceland are not as bad a side, I think, as I thought they were. <laughs> uh, I thought England were just really shit, which is why they got beat. And I thought they'd be weaker than they were in the, back in the uh, last World Cup. Uh, sorry, the Euros. No, um, they're not. They're really good. Uh, this is their first ever World Cup. play so Argentina they've got to get better um, can I not go back <laughs> there we go um, which is there we go this is the FIFA official FIFA website by the way you might dislike FIFA but their website's actually quite nice to be fair um, Peru Denmark another fascinating game uh, Peru coming into it were um, kind of a lot of people's if not dark horses, like in the same way to like say Costa Rica last World Cup, there were people's like you know there's some good talent in that team and people need to be wary of them. Um, they haven't been in the World Cup since I think 1984, um, and they gave a really good account of themselves. They were very very unlucky not to get a point in this game. They missed a penalty, which was a shocking penalty, admittedly, but they played really well. Um, I think they could beat Australia, and I think if they play like that, they could beat France, because they could still go through. Um, Denmark, again, they could beat France. Um, and, and I, I think they rely a little bit on Ericsson and Kasper Schmeichel, like Schmeichel played a real stormer. As you say, we've seen some great goalkeeping performances, him, the Iceland goalkeeper, um, the Iranian goalkeeper did pretty well as well. We've seen some not so good goalkeeper performances as well. Um, but yeah, really fascinating game and uh, I really hope Peru can get a, a good result because they look like a team, again like Iceland, where uh, although a bit more flamboyant than Iceland, but you can tell they play for each other like they're a real team uh, in there. Sometimes that's hard to get at international level because uh, players play for all different clubs, sometimes they play for rival clubs and um, yeah, it's fantastic to see that, that kind of team come together and that can make all the difference, you know, all the difference. So, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing Peru's next match. And, I mean, Denmark, yes, they, I think they were lucky to get a win out of that game. But they did win. And that makes the group very interesting. And then the final game was, I'd say, probably the worst game of the... Uh, maybe not, maybe France-Australia was, but Croatia beat Nigeria 2-0. And I don't think Croatia even got out of, like, second gear. Um... Nigeria looked really, really poor. Um, they looked like they did against England in that first half, really. And the second half against England, they started to play some good football, got a goal back. But, um, yeah, they just looked poor. Um, a lot of people had a lot of hopes for Nigeria. But I don't know what it is, but every time we seem to see African nations come to World Cups, I don't know what it is. They, they just don't seem to do that well, even though they have a lot of fantastic players. Um, I wouldn't say this is a vintage Nigeria side um, the goalkeeper's not great their defence isn't very good but there's certainly some good players in there and they should have given Croatia more to think about um, Croatia side are, are decent if not a little bit ageing um, Rakitic, Modric Perisic, Mandzukic um, but they played together a long time I guess and that's an advantage for them um, so yeah but uh kind of disappointing I guess for Nigeria really and they've they, they've got a lot of work to do you know um, they've got to play Argentina and Iceland and I, I can't see them getting anything out of those games if they play like that so I think it could be a bad World Cup for Nigeria uh, that group D is, is a tough group though um, Argentina have got to play Croatia and Nigeria I can see them beating Nigeria but I don't know about Croatia I, I think we've still got to see more from Croatia I think that was a, a walk in the park for them against Nigeria to be fair uh, 
so that could be interesting because if Croatia beat Argentina, Argentina are out. Because <laughs> uh, I'd expect Iceland to beat Nigeria. So, tough times. You know, Argentina have got to come through and, uh, and play some decent football. Uh, in terms of the games we've got today, so Sunday 17th, uh, kicking off in about 40 minutes, Costa Rica, Serbia. That's an interesting game. I'm, I'm interested in Serbia because... Um, Shevich plays for them, who's obviously a Crystal Palace player. And, uh, you know, okay, by the looks of it, he's in the starting lineup, which is great. They've got some good players there. Mitrovic has been on great form. Matic, Lajevic, uh, I'm rooting for Serbia. Um, no offence to Costa Rica, but because they've got a Palace player on Serbia's side. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how Costa Rica do. Again, they didn't look great against England. Um, but, you know, you never know. They're the underdogs going in there, but a lot of the time the underdogs can do well in the World Cup without that pressure. Uh, Germany, Mexico will be very interesting. You get to see how Germany um, actually uh, kind of come through and play. And I think Mexico are quite an old side. I can't believe Marquez is still playing for them. It's, it's ridiculous. He's 39. Um, yeah, they've got some, some good players. Uh, but they're getting on a little bit. Hernandez is 29, Velas, uh, sorry, Hernandez is 30, Velas is 29. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Um, I feel like the Germany team is very, very good. I literally cannot believe they did take Sane. I, I, I cannot, cannot work that one out in my mind. I would have taken Sane over Ozil any day of the week. Anyone in the Premier League would have. I know it's a slightly different position, but come on, Jesus Christ. But anyway, and then we get to see Brazil later on for the first time as well. Very fascinating to see that. They're my pick to win it. Um, not really a very original pick, but I think they're going to do well. And then tomorrow, uh, so Monday the 18th, sees England against Tunisia. Um, very much looking forward to that. There seems to be a lot of trepidation and fear. England always struggle against teams who sit deep, but you know, we'll see. Um, if we win that, I think we qualify from the group. Otherwise, it could be tricky. Um, so yeah, certainly loads of like interesting games to come. I think it's been a fantastic World Cup so far. Um, um, uh, yeah, really, really interesting so far. I just wonder if they had like. I guess we know the golden boot currently is with Ronaldo, isn't it? But Diego yeah, Costa on two, I guess, and Scherz is said I can't even pronounce his name, but he's on two for Russia. Um, but yeah, I think it's been fascinating. As I said, like you don't get perhaps the same high level quality football that you would do if you're watching the later stages of the Champions League, because obviously teams there play together week in, week out, and if you have a weakness in an area, you can go out and buy a player to fix that. You know teams, you know, like Argentina, they have to put up with not having a great goalkeeper or defence. Uh, but I don't feel like they made the best of it though. You have to that's what you have to do in international football, I think play to your strengths, make the best of what you've got. Um, and I don't feel Argentina did that at all against Iceland. Um, but yeah, fascinating. Let me know your thoughts on the first eight games. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have been enjoying the World Cup as much as I have. Until then, thank you for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.